First Wednesdays is sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council and by the Kellogg Hubbard Library, with video production supported by Orca Media. Welcome to First Wednesdays, this wonderful statewide humanities lecture series sponsored by the Humanities Council, Vermont Humanities Council. And it's also, and the, the, I'm Tom McCombe, Executive Director of the Kellogg Hubbard Library. We are uh, very pleased that we are the local hosts of this series. It's great to have the uh, First Wednesdays here eight months of the year, which is great. And also, this is the beginning of uh, Poem City. So this is a, you know, a big event throughout the month of April. <laughs> there are uh, programs in the back, uh, right outside the door there, and uh, 42 different events this month. So it's one, more than one a month. Lots and lots of great stuff. Um, I especially recommend the uh, Robert Frost <laughs> I, yes, Robert Frost on uh, Thursday the 19th over at the Humanities Council. Peter Gilbert does a great job with that every year. So the, um, We also have uh, sign-up sheets coming around. So if you're not already on the mailing list for Humanities Council, uh, that's a great opportunity. And we have feedback sheets out um, just outside the door. So if you would fill one of those in afterwards, that would be helpful too. So, in a moment, um, I'm going to ask you to welcome the Executive Director of the Vermont Humanities Council, who is going to introduce this evening's speaker in modern English, not in middle English, I right hear, but anyway, would you please welcome Peter Gilbert. <laughs> Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you all for, uh, for being here. It is a, a, a pleasure to have no snow on a first Wednesday occasion. That's pretty special around here. Um, I want to thank, first of all, the host of uh, the first Wednesday's program here in Montpelier, the Kellogg Hubbard Library, and Rachel Seneschel and Tom McCohen for being about the best darn uh, colleagues and um, uh, hosts that one could imagine for this program. Um, I also want to thank the three statewide hosts for First Wednesdays, the Alma Gibbs Donchin Foundation, the National Life Group Foundation, and the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences through the Vermont Department of Libraries. Um, I want to do a little housekeeping here because, as you know, we've had to cancel two First Wednesdays back-to-back. Uh, -to -back. And so I want to tell you that uh, two weeks from tonight is uh, the rescheduled program from um, February. It's the Thetford Chamber Singers who are going to be singing um, poetical related um, uh, music. And that's going to be at the Unitarian Church two weeks from tonight. Uh, the March program is going to be on June 20. And uh, I encourage you to go to that too. Um, the speaker has the memorable name Ed McMahon. It's not that Ed McMahon. He's not able, to, he's not available. <laughs> Um, but Ed McMahon is a, a distinguished fellow who's going to be talking about the importance of uniqueness in place, lest our state, our community, end up look like, <coughs> looking like every, uh, everywhere America. Uh, so I encourage you, uh, you to go on those. Next week's uh, program is going to be on time. Uh, Carol Berry is going to be speaking about Vincent Van Gogh and the books he read. So those are three uh, uh, terrific programs. Um, two of them um, and, and fortnightly, two weeks apart. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce, introduce our uh, speaker this evening. Peter Travis retired from Dartmouth College, where he was an English professor back in uh, 2015. He was the Henry Winkley Professorship of uh, Anglo-Saxon and English Language and Literature. He taught courses on Chaucer, medieval drama, Old English and Icelandic literature, men's studies, and literary theory. His major field of interest has always been Chaucer, and his book, The Seminal Chaucer, won the Brooks Warren Prize for Excellence in Literary Criticism in 2010. Uh, I will just say that I know from personal experience that uh, uh, Professor Travis 
um, encouraged his students to develop skills in reading Chaucer's Middle English with accuracy, or at least attempting to, and dramatic insight. It's a pleasure to have Peter Travis here. Please join me in welcoming him. Um, there's a handout there is going to be part of your homework assignment. So does everybody have one, or should I? Okay. wonderful to be here. Uh, I guess the first wonder is that Peter Gilbert introduced me. Now, he didn't, uh, for some occult reason, uh, explain what he knows about Chaucer and how to uh, memorize Chaucer and make your own uh, tape of Chaucer or your own CD of Chaucer. And that's because he took the Chaucer course that I taught at Dartmouth, lo, those many, many, many uh, years ago. So it's a, rather a wonder to see um, teacher and student from those bygone days still managing to uh, make it around <laughs> and keep their minds uh, alive. So it's really wonderful to have Peter uh, introduce me. The other thing is that uh, that's making it wonderful for me is that uh, I have to, uh, the plan is to go for about an hour and a half. Uh, I want the first 45 minutes to be mostly me, but I want you to interrupt me anytime, and the next 45 minutes to be, uh, to be Q and A. But I, uh, my maternal grandmother's uh, maiden name was Delena. And uh, there's a restaurant uh, in town, Delena's, uh, which was started by my kid sister uh, just a little while ago. And I've only eaten there once. So I'm going to make sure I make it down there before, uh, before, before they nine. Close. What? Before they close. Before they close at nine. Yes, yes. OK. Oh. How many of you um, have had some familiarity with Chaucer? How many of you, OK, that's a lot of hands. It says something about our age, too, probably. How many of you studied uh, Chaucer some uh, what in high school? That's a lot of hands. In college, still a lot of hands. Anybody go beyond that? A few ringers? Where, where, where are you as a graduate? Graduate school. Graduate school, cool. And? Uh, personal uh, friendship with John Elder, who, uh, yes. who we shared uh, John yes. sales right. with over, uh, over a couple of years. OK. And how many of you uh, memorized some of Chaucer? <laughs> Look at all those hands. Well, one of the things I promise uh, you will do is we'll do some of the uh, introduction to the general prologue and get our chops up again uh, reading, uh, reading some Middle English. If you were a generation or two uh, less uh, wise, uh, your hands would not be going up very much. Because one of the things I've noticed over the years is that uh, Chaucer's being st uh, studied a little bit less in uh, AP English. And memorizing Chaucer is pretty much a dying art. It used to be when I got on a plane, somebody turns to me, and I feel like I do want to talk to the person. If, if I feel like I'm not so keen on uh, wanting to talk to that person, and that person says, well, what do you do? I say, I'm a medievalist, and that just shuts it right down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if I say I teach Chaucer, you know, I just, just pause, and then, oh, it was a beautiful way of, uh, of going through midlife. Uh, but there are fewer and fewer students who are learning how to do this. OK, so I have a bit of an assignment given myself about talking about Chaucer. And I really want to talk about Chaucer uh, writ large. But we're also going to read some passages and do some close, uh, cl close analysis. Chaucer himself, folks who you're coming in, let's you have to have that hand out, all right? Uh, Chaucer, born in the 14th century, 1345, something like died in uh, 1400, was sort of upper middle class. His father was a vintner, uh, a, a London boy, 
We don't know if he went to university, but he obviously uh, acquired an extraordinarily extensive uh, education. He was a polyglot, like almost anybody in the, in the literati class uh, at his age, uh, at his time, so that he could command at least four different languages, or let's say three anyway, which were, first of all, English and then French, because uh, French is the language that came in with 1066 and all that. It was the power language, even uh, in Chaucer's time, it was the language of law, and it was the language of uh, elegant uh, poesy, poetry. So French, English, and then? And then, pardon? Did I hear you? Latin. Latin, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Latin, absolutely. Why? Because Latin was the language, if you went to grammar school, why do we still call it grammar school? The first thing you did is you started reading Latin and learning the, the grammar of Latin. And you started reading uh, the distichs of Cato. You started reading uh, the, uh, the fables of Aesop. Uh, the book that I wrote on Chaucer, which took me only 25 years to write, is about this one beast fable that uh, Chaucer wrote, uh, wrote the, the Nun's Priest Tale. And I argue that it's Chaucer's Ars Poetica. He sort of crams everything. Uh, into this mashup of, an, uh, of, a, of a poem and so that's very much about poetry and he was trying to bring his, you know, he was succeeding in bringing his readers back to the basics of literature, literary appreciation, literary composition, um, and literary analysis. So we have French, uh, English, Latin, uh, and then beyond that, uh, Chaucer actually traveled to Italy several times and when he came back, it's clear that he was extremely accomplished in Italian. He essentially brought Dante, uh, Dante's poetry, into the English canon. He brought uh, Boccaccio and so on. A little bit more about Chaucer's life. Um, he married, uh, married up. Um, he did not seem to live with his wife uh, all that long uh, or for many, uh, for many months in, in any year. His wife was staying at court. She was a lady in waiting. Uh, he was a man of many um, useful means. Uh, a, uh, he was clerk of the king's work. Uh, he was the king's uh, forester. He was probably his most important uh, job uh, was as the um, customs uh, officer who was in charge of all the wool going out of England and uh, to the continent. Wool was the major English export in Chaucer's time. And in fact, even today, as I understand it, uh, the Queen of England, when she sits on her throne, she puts her, uh, her feet, her elegant feet, on a uh, pillow, and what's in the pillow? Wool. So he was an extremely important uh, position, very easily corruptible for a short length of time. Then uh, the political uh, climate changed. Uh, he was let go. He went to Kent, and for the last 13 or 14 years of his life, seems to, seemed to have lived further away from the power center, although he was never terribly close. He was just looking on from the outside in the power center. He was, he was, um, he was lucky that he wasn't beheaded at a few uh, very dicey moments. Uh, he uh, was involved in the Hundred Year War for a short period. He was, um, uh, he was captured, he was ransomed. Um, but going to Italy as an ambassador for Richard II, uh, he was in pretty, um, in, for pretty important negotiations. And there, although we don't think he met Boccaccio, he picked up a lot of poetry and, uh, and brought it back. There are, I think, something like 457 entries into Chaucer's life records. Not a single one of those life records mentions the fact that Chaucer was a poet. Um, we do know that he was known and recognized as a poet in, uh, in the court and in the coterie of the, of the literati and the intelligentsia. We are pretty certain he read his poetry aloud, uh, and we certainly his manuscripts were being shuffled around. But it wasn't until a, 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 a generation after his death that he suddenly became, suddenly, uh, very important. Everybody thought of themselves as a neo-Chaucerian poet, and Chaucer became the, the, the father of uh, English poetry from there on out. So he now, even though we're not memorizing his lines very much, is still considered to be one of the, say, top three uh, of the uh, pre-modern poets. The others would be Shakespeare, Milton, right? So uh, his, his um, cachet or his cultural uh, capital is uh, still very high. I belong to the fraternity and sorority of Chaucerians, and we're still doing quite, quite well. 
I just got an invitation, I think I'm going to say no, to give, contribute uh, some essays for a four-part encyclopedia of Chaucer's uh, studies. It's going to be about this big. So in, in terms of the industry, uh, Chaucer is still doing pretty well, but I'm a little bit worried as we go, for, not, not that I disapprove of where we're going, but we're going much more into global literary studies and further away from the Anglophile uh, alignment that we have been in. So that's um, Chaucer's life. The poetry that uh, he wrote in his life, and I'm going to concentrate on the Canterbury Tales, which is what we mostly remember, um, but I don't want to give short shrift to everything else. Early in his career, he wrought, wrote uh, four dream visions. One was the Book of the Duchess, um, and influenced a great deal by uh, Anglo-Norman poetry. One was the House of Fame, which was a kind of parodic mashup and send up and parody uh, of uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, another one was the Parliament of Fowls, which is a uh, sort of a, um, a Valentine's Day celebration of love and the erotic polity. All the players are birds, uh, and uh, it's really an inquiry into what is love and what makes the world go round and what is nature and what is sex. Um, and in fact, it's the first poem ever to mention St. Valentine's Day. It seems, in fact, that maybe somehow Chaucer invented uh, St. <laughs> St. Valentine's Day. So there are, uh, and, then, and then there's uh, uh, the Legend of Good Women, which is a series of tales about uh, women who were not that good and who suffered uh, a great deal. The other major poem that Chaucer wrote before uh, he got to the Canterbury Tales in the last 14 years or so of his life was Troilus and Cressida. Any, any recognitions of Troilus and Cressida? Mm -hmm. Chaucer wrote, I mean, uh, Shakespeare wrote uh, Troilus and Cressida. Robert Henryson, in between the two of them, wrote his, uh, uh, his version of the Troilus story. But this is a long uh, poem, five parts, epic romance, philosophical inquiry, set in Troy, uh, but very much about uh, civilization and its discontents, about courtly love and about warfare, and um, essentially about Chaucer's contemporary uh, life and culture, although it is set very much uh, in the classical past. And it also happens to be the greatest love poem written in the English language. Should I say that again? The greatest love poem uh, written in the English language, uh, and it is a beauty. Some Chaucerians say, I sort of report, re, uh, prefer uh, Troilus over uh, the Canterbury Tales. So the Canterbury Tales are the tales that we know uh, are know best. And as I mentioned, Chaucer is writing those tales for the last 14 or so years of his life. They survive in many fragments. They floated around in, uh, uh, in his, uh, in his uh, lifetime. Uh, he obviously had many readers, but they never were a unity. There never was a single manuscript. And we're not at all clear what Chaucer's final version uh, of that uh, of that masterpiece might have been is probably the truth it was that he was just going to keep writing tale after tale after tale, <laughs> fitting them in here, here, there, and there. In some ways that made sense, in some ways that it frankly did not make sense. Uh, what was supposed to make sense in the 13th century was a master summa, a great work which puts everything together in a kind of uh, encyclopedia, uh, encyclopedic um, synopticon of all uh, Western learning. Uh, and so you would have uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, where you have a um, hundred cantique, right? And when you get to a hundred, you know you're there, okay? Or the, the Decameron, again, by Boccaccio, a hundred tales, when you get to the last one, you know you're there. In the Canterbury Tales, there was a kind of um, sort of casual um, agreement as to how many tales were going to be told. And there were going to be 120, a little bit more about that in a minute. But I think that's sort of Chaucer's inside joke. Okay, you guys, uh, you, can, you can write 100. I'm going to do more than that. I'm going to do 120. But he only ended up with about 24. And he probably would have kept on adding some here and there and moving them around in those different fragments until he came to uh, the very end. There's no doubt that he came to the last tale, but uh, more about that in a minute. He had a choice to make, first of all, to write in English. Uh, he could have written, as we've already mentioned, in other languages. He could have written in Latin. He could have written, written in French. His contemporary John Gower 
uh, wrote in Latin, French, and also in English. But Chaucer, with a few exceptions, decided to write just in English. And this was a significant, maybe political and cultural uh, decision to have been made. Uh, it's not that English was considered to be a highly refined, poetic, cultivated language. In fact, just remember, uh, in the 14th century, and after that as well, England was this tiny little dot out in the North Sea, right? It was so far away from the center of the action, okay, culturally, religiously, philosophically, uh, and in every other way. And the language, you know, who read English in the 14th century? Only, you know, simple-minded Englishmen. So he was, you know, he was making a major decision that he was going to try to do something that could at least stand up in some degree uh, against the, 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 the poetry, the Italian uh, verse of Picaccio or the, uh, the French of Machot, uh, etc. Okay, so he decided that he's going to write an English poem about the English and about contemporary Englishmen in English, in Middle English. Poetry in England had been thriving. First of all, and you all know that it's, uh, Chaucer's poetry was Middle English. But there was something before Middle English, low, what do we call it? Old English, right? And uh, I'll give you a little bit of Old English, okay? Uh, just to get a, you know, just to orally uh, get the sense of what it was like. This is the first poem to have been recorded uh, in the English language. It's about eighth century, it's, it's Cadman's <coughs> Hymn. Some of you may remember Cadman's Hymn. Okay. New shulin cherian, heaven reaches ward, May it hold us machta, on this mode you thunk, work, wolderfather, swaye wonder you ass, eche drichten, after teada, firum foldan, freya almichi. Any Rorschach, um, you know, responses to that? I mean, I mean, extremely dramatic. Who said that? Okay. It is, why is it very Germanic? It is Germanic, it's, it, it's German. Uh, English is an entirely Germanic language. We could go into what, how you define what a language. Totally Germanic. Anything else? Do you notice about it? Rhythmic. Hmm? Rhythmic. Rhythmic. Yeah, and open up on the, what do you mean by that? What is the rhythm? Re regular stresses on the line right. and, and internal uh, rhymes as well. Uh, part A, yes. Very regular stresses. As a matter of fact, I think of chopping wood, you know? I used to chop wood to Old English, you know? Honk, honk. <laughs> and then what's called a caesura, a pause, honk, honk. All right, very strong uh, tetrameter beat, right? It's only later Chaucer brought it in, actually. We have iambic pentrameter, and we have a fifth beat, and he starts, you know, jazzing around uh, with what uh, can happen. But it's, it's a, a very rhythmic uh, kind of poetry. And did I see a hand here? No? Well, I just had a question when you were done. No, go ahead. Has anyone, have you ever heard anyone compare Old English to rap? Oh, totally. Good, <laughs> yes. And why did you say that? It just occurred to me oh, when I saw someone reciting it, I thought, wow. Well, it is very much <laughs> like rap. Now, the question, please? Okay, the question was, oh, am I too far away? I mean, should, should I try to stay here? Okay. I asked our video man, is that all right? Because I, I get excited and I start, I'll try to stay right here. All right. It is very much like rap. Uh, although all the rhythms of rap come from West Africa and so on. And in rap you have, you know, a lot of uh, scratching of the record and, you know, beats back like that, but you have the, the whole variety of rhythms. In Old English, you had a, a, a harp, which was plucked, okay, and uh, there have been attempts to try to reimagine what that harp was like. And then you had, not rhyme, but you had alliteration. And so you had rules of alliteration. There have to be three or two uh, alliterative stresses, and then the, the, there's a rule of stresses as, as well in those. And this was oral formulaic poetry. And it was a poetry that was composed according to some rather complicated um, parameters and paradigms of imagery, uh, of sound and alliteration, and, and of rhythm. And if you were a good shop, as they were called, a master poet in, uh, in Old English poetry, you could stand up and recite poems for hours. You had not memorized them. You did not memorize them, but you had a conce conception of what the poem was like, 
and uh, or what the narrative was like, and you could do all kinds of ring all, all kinds of changes on that because there are different ways of describing a battle scene. There are different ways of uh, describing a reception scene. There's a different way of uh, to describing ships and things like that. If you're thinking of Homer for a moment, yes, that's also an oral law formulaic uh, tradition. So that's a tradition that survived up until the 11th century, and then, you know, things really changed uh, very radically. In Chaucer, we have oral poetry, because I'm, I'm pointing my ear. We know Chaucer read aloud, but it was also literate poetry, and he, you know, he was writing it down. And the sound of the poetry, now maybe we can move, move to this now, is different from that Germanic sound that we've just heard. So let's turn to our handout here. And after, you know, I just gave you some, some dates and so on, we have the introduction to uh, the general prologue that a number of us remember rather fondly. And I am going to read a bit so you can get to hear it. Then we can talk about it's or what it sounds like. And then we're going to go back and read it together and do some other things as well. Uh, the first line, Juan that opera with the Shura Sota, the Dracht of March hath passed it to the Rota. See where we are? Hey, how timely can it be? <laughs> right? That's exactly where we are, right? As the sweet showers, weren't they sweet this afternoon? You know, are, you know, are replacing the, the, the drought of March. Okay. So uh, to hear a little bit more. And then I'm going to have you chime in, and we can do it uh, in unison too. But I'll just, for those of you who want to be reminded or haven't heard it for a while, Juan that Apru with the Shore Sota, the Drost of March hath pierced to the Rota, and bothered every vein and switched liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the floor. Juan Zephyrus ache with the sweet of wraith, in spirit hath in every holt and hath the tender croppers, and the younger sunna hath in the ram his how the coursey runner, and smaller foolers mock and melodia, that slapen all the nicht with open ear, so pricketh them not sure and hear courages. Fun longin folk to gone on pilgrimages, and parmas for to sake and strange stranders, to fair no hallways couth and sundry launders. On specially from every sheer resender of Engelon to countably they wenda, the holy, blissful martyr for to sake uh, that hem meth on that they were sake. Uh. Now, it's, you know, I know it's, it's a lot to sort of take on when you're trying to read it and trying to hear it and trying to, and trying to uh, interpret it, but let's have an impressionistic you know, response too. What, what are the impressions? How does it hit you? Yes? I love this <laughs> opening stanza, especially the line about the little birds <laughs> that can't keep their eyes closed. I think about that every spring. Me too. Incredible <laughs> simulation. So I have a question that probably everybody... Is it about the birds or is it about... I, we don't want to leave the birds, right? It's about the first line, actually. Well, can we do a little bit on the birds, and then we'll get to your question? Birds? So what are the birds are doing here? Well, they're mocking the, the melody. They're, mocking, they're jumping up and down on the branch. They can't sleep. Why can't they sleep? They're so hot. They're so charged. They're so turned on. They're so ready to fall in love, right? So it's wonderful, just one of the, the pizzicati, you know, way of expressing the, you know, the beauty, the lyricism of, uh, of ardent uh, desire. Yes, now, first line. Yeah, okay, so maybe this is totally well known, but I always think that April being the cruelest month, the yes. of P.S. Eliot has to be a reference to Totally, this absolutely. Saying, okay, Chaucer had it all wrong. Well, <laughs> okay, April is the cruelest, uh, cruelest month, so it's the opening of the wasteland. What's, well, what's Tisteus Eliot doing to where we are right now? What is, he, what, is he, what is he saying about the great tradition or about cultural change? Well, he's turned it inside out. It's yeah. the longing that he feels is unrequited. Oh, you're talking about Eliot? Yeah. Yeah, that would be the cruelty that he, it's unrequited, right? Or he's also I, I, evoking the First World War. It, well, this is you know this is the wasteland that he's talking about, and everything has gone down the tubes, right? And so spring, which would be the season of rebirth, regeneration, of joy, of pot potential salvation, you know, Anglo-Catholic, 
uh, is not, it's just, just a, a wasteland, it's death, nothing is being renewed. So it's a totally direct citation, you know, an intertextual citation, and it's just to be contrasted with, with, let's add the adjectives here. What were some of the adjectives or nouns that you would like to add about the feeling of, about life or about the world or about nature that you get from Chaucer? Ardent is the one. Ardent, ardent, ardor, right. And, and longing. And longing. Oh, gosh, desire, desire, longing, and. But this good longing. Yeah. Yes. And. Well, well it, while you're reading it, it sounded Scandinavian. Yeah. Danish or uh, Norwegian or any of those. Yeah. Well, I think. Well, I think like a uh, Bergman film. <laughs> Bergman, Bergman's pretty dark for you know for Chaucer, but there is, and maybe it's my own inflection, but I think that, and I think I may be sort of you know, Scandinavianizing uh, a little bit. But remember, German, Scandinavian is German as well. It's Swedish. But it's Swedish. I there was a lilt that sounded almost Scottish. Okay. Rogue. Okay. <laughs> but In there, places. Yeah. Right. Well, why not? I mean, well, Scottish. The, well, we, we talk, we're talking. We're talking about. We're not. We're, well, we're not talking about Gaelic Scots. We're talking about English yeah. Scots or Lowland Scots. And sure, there would be a little there or Irish. I spent a couple of years in Ireland, and I find myself sort of swerving over there as well. But mostly, it's of course American is my accent. If you hear British, you know, read it. They, they read it differently. But did, also, go ahead. Yes. Oh, I was just going to say, um, it also reminded me of um, independent um, people. The, oh, um, that the Lacks Lacks book which Yes. I just finished. <laughs> and one of the characters is a poet, right. Dark Tar, yeah. and um, so you never heard his poetry, but he was known mm. for his traditional kind of poetry. Right. Yeah. Well, the, the Icelandic poetic tradition is another one. The Icelanders did come over to England after Chaucer's time. I mean, be, before Chaucer's time, sorry, before Chaucer's time. But languages were close enough so that they could understand each other. The, uh, the, the Icelandic uh, poetic rules are much more complicated than the uh, uh, than the uh, uh, than the uh, Anglo-Saxon ones are, but in, in the independent people, he's keeping that alive. And that was you know that was 1930s. I mean that was an, an accurate depiction of what they were doing. Still then, I have fallen in love recently with the uh, with the Icelandic <laughs> sagas. Uh, but okay, uh, but, okay. I'd also, have we mentioned French? I mean, didn't you hear the French there? This is something that's really been added to the mix, which adds a, a I don't know what what you want to call it, but to the oral effect and the lyricism of the poetry, and also makes it easier for us to begin to make sense of. Yes. Okay. A few more uh, responses to this passage. Well, April even here in Vermont always gives the promise of spring, yeah, I, regardless of the fact that it snowed this morning. It, you still, the daffodils are coming right. up, and, it, and it's going to happen. And like many of us, these pilgrims have been cooped up all winter, and yes. they're just bursting. Same as the daffodils, same as the birds in their excitement. Right. They got to get out of the house. Too far off shrines. They don't want to just go to the neighbors. They right. want to get out and, and do something. <laughs> and that, that just is so. Clear this. It's kind of wonderlust, right? Perhaps to where the sun shines. And, and the burstingness, where are they going? You mentioned it, but where, what are they going towards? Uh, to shine uh, to St. Thomas? Yes. And uh, for the endless relics? Yes. I mean, Chaucer could have, this is all one sentence, by the way, did you notice? One <laughs> ample, ardent, uh, deeply breathing sentence. You have to take a breath and keep, breath, but keep on going. But where do you end up? I mean, it's a little bit. If either a non sequitur or a surprise, where are they all going with this bursting outness? To the shrine of St. Thomas, where the last two lines, the holy blissful martyr for to sake uh, that hameth hopen when that they were sake. A wonderful ream reach, you know, seek and sick, seek and sick. And so you end up with a spiritual longing, right? A spiritual desire which is going beyond the elan vital desire or the sexual desire or the wonderlust desire. Now, whether or not they are conflatable, whether or not they are opposable, uh, whether or not one builds on the other, questions to, uh, to wonder over. But all by way of showing you how rich, yes, and how exciting this springtime opening is.
Yes, way back there. It's always, um, I, I first read this at Word and Five Heart about 50 years ago, and it, it always feels like a very joyful passage. Yes. Okay, but, but also the rhythm, um, part of the rhythm is the rhythm of walking, of yeah. setting out on foot, knowing that you may be walking for 50 miles or 1,000 miles. Right. And that's another thing I love in it. Or if you're lucky, you're riding, you know? <laughs> okay. So, beautiful. Uh, Let's, let's, let's try to or, or walk forward a little bit from that. So this is the introduction to the Canterbury Tales. What are the Canterbury Tales? They're tales told while we're riding, right? They're told by 30 pilgrims who just by chance, Biaventure or Kass, meet in one inn, the Tabard Inn in Southwark, uh, uh, south of the Thames. And the innkeeper, Harry Bailey, we learn his name in, in, in due time, decides that he would like to ride with them as well partly because it's going to be good business. And he says, well, let's, you know, let's entertain ourselves as we go along. So we will tell stories, tales as we go out and tales as we go out. And he's the guy who comes up with the idea, well, each of us will tell two tales going out and two tales coming back. And you know, it's like what happens when you're thrown together in a group. Uh, I don't want to be too pejorative about the sort of person who always takes over, but he's a takeover kind of person. Harry is like that. And, uh, but everybody said, OK. Uh, whatever you say. And Harry says, I'm going to be the judge for the person who tells the tale uh, uh, of best sentence and most solace. That is, most meaning and most, uh, most delight. So if you were to add them all up, as I mentioned already, there would be 120 tales. But then Chaucer, in this frame narrative, and there's really nothing like it elsewhere in Western literature, where you have individualized people, and we'll get to the individualization in a minute, each tell one or two tales, uh, which are tailored, that's not a pun, for, for them. And uh, they get involved with each other. They get in, in some kind of dialogue with each other. They get into some kind of series of debates with each other. Somebody mentioned the wife of Bath. Uh, the wife of Bath introduces a se sequence of tales that turn out to be many different uh, uh, readings of uh, the sacrament of marriage or the, the existential challenges of marriage and things like that. But it is a wonderful potpourri of a variety of tales which seem to have things to do with each other, but they're not just lined up in, the, in a kind of linear fashion and saying, OK, this follows this, tit follows that, and so on. So there's a wonderful collection of tales being told. The poetic fiction is, as you're on the road, going to Canterbury. And I think it's important never to forget that these are told on a pilgrimage, never to forget what the ideal of pilgrimage is, and that pilgrimage is a metaphor for the pilgrimage of life. Canterbury is a you know, simulacrum of the New Jerusalem, but also what are, some of the, what are some of the real realities of pilgrimages in Chaucer's time, would you think? What were people really doing on pilgrimages? Not very sacred, <laughs> <laughs> right? I, I mean, people went on pilgrimages well, to steal from each other, to, you know, to get away from the spouse, uh, to, to have a wild time, um, to never change from what they were before, maybe even get worse. And so the Lollards, who were the pure Puritans on the you know, theologically political left, said, this is one of the worst offenses of the, of the Catholic Church, pilgrimages. Just, so it's a complicated uh, ritual. Uh, and its valence or its significance goes in many directions, and Chaucer's explaining it. OK, with us so far? Now, every one, with the exception of two, of these pilgrimages, the 30 of them, is given a portrait, sort of a personal poem describing who they are. Following certain rules of portraiture, they are called afficiones, and uh, each one is a remarkable accomplishment in his or her own right, uh, and each one could be studied at great length. I have just chosen one for us to do some close reading. You ready for this now? Uh, to see how we can do reading through one portrait. It's not like we're going to get to the tale by this person, but this is the monk. So the next, well, I guess at the back of our, the handouts, is a portrait of the monk. Um, before we start, these, these pilgrims, for the most part, don't have personal names. They're just called the so-and-so and the so-and-so. So, -and -so. so is, this is the monk. What was a monk? 
What is a monk? What were monks? What's the ideal monk? What do you think of when you think of monk? monk religious monk? person? Religious. And Cha there are a lot of religious people on this pilgrimage. And a lot of them are not treated very well by Chaucer at all. OK, so religious, keep on going. Silent. Yeah. Allow the contemplation. Well, OK, you do have the, the right wing, the Cistercians, who have vows of silence. But what are the vows that they all take? Poverty, chastity. Pa OK, chastity. Don't, don't go too fast. Poverty, Poverty chastity, chastity obedience. obedience. Got it? Poverty, chastity, obedience. OK. What else about monks? What is the life? Well, well, don't go too, don't editorialize yet. Uh, okay, and okay, what, what, what else can you say about monks? I mean, they lived out of society. They lived out of society. The secular church, like priests and so on, lived in society and dealt with their parishioners, right? In the towns, in the villages, in the cities. But if you, if you took vows of claustration, you lived in a cloister, and it's supposed to be a hortus conclusus, that is supposed to be um, a, a terrestrial image of the eternal garden of paradise, all right? So you went into this, this closed-off world, and what did you do in that world? Pray and work. Yes, you prayed and you work. work. Pray and work, OK? Orare and laborare, all right? You pray and you work. Anybody want to add a bit more there? You had the hours, you know, seven hours. You know, these are seven different occasions in one day that you went and, and worshiped, and you read. Did I hear something? OK, um, their different um, monastic orders had different attitudes towards, towards study. Is study work? Some of them were quite scholarly, and they would sit there in the scriptoria, and they would read the sacred texts. And that was considered to be a very devout way of life. They, by the way, when they read, did you know that they read aloud? The whole idea of reading silently was sort of a bastardized Reformation uh, concept. But yes, they could, they, they, they could read. Uh, but the attitude towards reading, was it a luxury or was it not a luxury? Was it only for the intelligentsia? Was you know a live issue? Yes? I know I'm anticipating a little here, yeah. but you wouldn't normally assume that a holy man would be terribly attractive or robust. OK, we're getting there. All right. Well, I'm sort of setting up the ideal, you know, the, 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 norm, the, the precepts that are, for the most part, operative. And I think we're fine, unless anybody wants to add something. OK, so. Um, Let's begin. I'm going to be reading a bit. This is going to go sort of pretty fast. I know I want to uh, concentrate on the very end of this, but we can do some stuff. Say, you know, asking ourselves, oh, look at this. Oh, what about this? What is Chaucer doing here? How are we supposed to feel? Okay? It's called literary criticism, all right? Okay. A month there was a fair for the maestria, an outri dare, the loved veneria, a manly man, to bane an abbot abel. Full stop. Any thoughts? And you got your translation on? No, you don't have a translation. <laughs> OK, there was a monk, and he was an excellent guy. He was a cool dude. An outrider. What's an outrider? Monk with business outside the monastery. Right. OK, let's pause right there. You know, there, there was a capacity that has a title. That was really important to what? To monasteries. Why? Because what was happening with monasteries? Well before Chaucer's time. They were becoming wealthy. They were dealing with the outside world. You know, they had farms. They had estates. They had wealth. They had wealth. And some of them were extraordinarily wealthy, all right? And if you had all of that going for you, you had to. You needed entrepreneurs. You need businessman types. You need you know, people who know how to do, deal with merchants and other, you know, out in the world. So you have outriders. So that's what we have with this guy. How do you feel about that? I don't know. He loved veneria. Comment? He wasn't chaste. Oh, wait a minute. No, no, venery. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, uh, worldly things. Oh, look where her mind is going. <laughs> <laughs> what does venery mean? Hunting. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm deploying your very good instincts. What is venery? Hunting. Hunting deer. <coughs> yeah, venison. <laughs> how, how could you ever think that you're supposed to think of something like that? So the point so far? I don't know. Ambiguity? 
suggestiveness, innuendo, satire, irony, parody, or straightforward. He likes to hunt deer. Okay, get those five right there. Okay, moving right along. A manly man, oh boy. I teach a whole course. This is not literature, it's something on masculinity. So what does that mean? Ask yourself, but this is what we're told is really important about this guy. He's a manly man uh, to be an abbot, and, and he, he really should become an abbot. Okay, moving right along fast. We're going to try to do the whole picture. Full many a dainty horse had he in stable, and when he rode, men meet his beetle hair, jingling in a whistling wind, all's clear, and ache as lewd as doth the chapel bella. There as his lord was caper of the cellar. Okay, a little bit of just sort of what's being told there. What do we, what do we, yes. It's, it's his, his, his bridle jingles as loud as the chapel bell, which is ironical. Well, it is, you know, there's a scene, that these are the Canterbury he's bells well, jingling along. Well, horse. <laughs> well, but I think you're implying is, of all things to compare those, you know, those bells to the chapel, oh, the cha oh, I forgot about the chapel bell. You know, wh what space is there between the sound of the bells on, his, on the bridle and the bells in the chapel? Major, a major, wide gap between the two of them. Any other comments, one or two? The yeah. decorative nature, which you don't associate with being a monk. Okay. Chaucer has a way of communionizing. He takes on the attributes and the sensibilities and the interests and the persuasions of people he's writing about. And you can tell, it's, I mean, Chaucer is saying, oh, he's got this breedle, he's got the jingling and the whistling is clear and loud and so on. This is an appreciation for the sensuous, I don't know, uh, tactileness and specificity and aliveness of, uh, of all of this. And after all, what is he like? He likes riding. He likes horses. So in a way, Chaucer is taking on that interest in the equestrian. Yeah. Uh, do you think sometimes uh, he's looking for a rhyme and he leaves it to the reader's intellect to make something interesting about it? What does that mean? What do you mean by that? Well, are you thinking of I'll a special? Yeah. Yeah, but are you thinking of a special rhyme here? Uh, just. Any two lines, can you accent the, the rhyme on just any two? Do you want me to read two rhymes? Just, yeah. Hair, Claire, Bell, Cell. Stable, stable. Yeah? yeah. Hair, Claire. Uh, I, I think sometimes with poets, uh, they're looking for a word that's kind of tricky to find a rhyme for, and that will generate some some thought on the person who's reading it to make it a little more interesting than maybe what he even thought of. I would, I would agree all. with you. I, I think if you, can find, if you can work for a rhyme, maybe you can find something that you didn't even know was there in your right. subconscious, right? Yes. Uh, I don't think the good poets are never desperate, but I think there are serendipities. Oh, he came like that. There's one a little bit further, Cloister and Oyster, okay? <laughs> Fantastic rhyme. <laughs> However, I was, sort of, you know, I was sort of disappointed to find out people have been using that rhyme for decades, you know? But okay, so can I? All right, so we stopped right there. The rule of St. Mar and of St. Benate, because that it was old and some del straight. What are we talking about here? Monastic rules. Monastic rules, okay, of the Benedictines uh, and, and Maurus. Because it was old fashioned, old fangled, a little bit too strict, okay? Because of that, uh, hey, uh, this Ilka monk let all the thing. Yeah, thing is passa and held out for the newer world is passa. He yaft not of that text to pull it hen, that saith that hunters be not holy men, nay that a monk, when he is retulace, is lignant till a fish that is water lace. This is to say in a monk out of his cloister. <laughs> but filk a text, he held not worth an oyster. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, you got it. So what, uh, help us out here. What, what's, what's, what do we see here? What's going on? We have a modern monk, right? We have a liberated monk, right? Help me out, I want some more adjectives. We have a monk who, is, who doesn't like the old ways. Keep on going. Reckless. A re well, retulous is sort of, water. he means, uh, yeah. Um, but he, he's of the new order, right? He's a new man. He's a new religious. Um, and um, he's liberated from you know, the, the confinements and constraints and the anal retentiveness 
uh, of the old order. Now, I'm on the last word here, last line, but Thilke text held he not worth an oyster, and he said his opinion was gold. What does that mean? I, you know, who's I here? Chaucer. Chaucer. Now, who is Chaucer is another thing, because Chaucer is, you know, projecting himself into this whole pilgrimage. Chaucer puts himself at the very end of all of the portraits with, with his rapscallions, the runts of the litter. And he says, and then I, I was there. I'm, I'm the poet. But he says, he's intruding, and, so, and I said his opinion was good. Chaucer is saying, let's just be very literal. What is he saying? <coughs> I, yes? Makes himself a sort of Stephen Colbert character <laughs> on that persona of, of gullibility and admiration okay. for scoundrels. Let, let's hold on to Stephen Colbert because he's a very complex Colbert is satirist. I would say Chaucer's a little bit more of an ironist or a satirist, but the, the, the Venn diagram over that. But he's saying, I agree with him, right? His opinion was good. So all of a sudden, you have this guy coming in, the narrator. As, as a person who is taking his position. And he says, what should he studia and mock himself of woad upon a boat in cloister all way to pour, or swinken with his handes and labor as Austin bit? Who shall the world be servant? Let Austin have his swing to him reserved. Boy, he's really getting on a tear here. What's he saying? Why should monks be out of the world and not doing good in the Why should he study, right? Why should he study? Why should he be cloistered? Yeah, why should he be closeted, cloistered, right? Why should he pour over a book? Remember the question we just asked? And why should he work with his hands, right? And labor, as Austin, Augustine, bad. How shall the world be served? Please help me out here. What's going on? Where are you? Are you being manipulated? Where, where's Chaucer? Where are we supposed to stand about this? Chaucer's championing. His hero identifying with the monk and saying, right on, I understand. But isn't that deeply ironic? <laughs> isn't it satirical, though? Ironic, cheek. satiric? Tongue in cheek. Huh? Tongue in cheek. Tongue in cheek? Yeah. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not being, you know, Chaucer is, is um, identifying with this guy, asking questions about this. I would say, and I, don't, I can't <laughs> dwell on it too long, but I think this is a very Chaucerian moment. And Chaucer's leaving it to us. Uh, I don't like calling Chaucer a satirist because I just think he's too nuanced. But he also sort of portrays himself, and you feel as this go along, as a sort of bit of a naive, you know, a little bit uh, gullible, a little bit overly impressionable. But he said, well, that makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. In and it's not other, like it's 100% wrong. In another era, he could have been burned at the stake for those two sentences alone. <laughs> Well, there, everybody was writing anti-religious satire all the time. If you wanted to get a target, get a religious organ. So I mean, people say, oh, because everybody's like that in the Middle Ages. No. OK, so he says, let Austin have his swing to him reserve it. Therefore, I like Chaucer's therefore is better than anything else in his poetry. <laughs> therefore, he was a precursor a richt. Precursor meaning? Hunter, gray hounds, he had as swift as fool and fleet, of pricking and of hunting for the hara, was all his lust, for no cost will he spara. He say his slave, and I'm going to go for a while, not stop, profil it up the hand with grease and at the finest of a land, and for to fasten his hold under his chin, a head of gold he wrought for a full curious pin. A lucanot in the greater end there was. His head was bollard, that shone as any glass, and ache his fast as he had been anoint. He was a lord full fat in gold point. <laughs> his e'en state and rolling in his head, that stame it as a furnace of a laid, his boat is supple, his horse in great start, knew certainly he was a fair prelate. <laughs> you could only have three more lines. Thoughts, comments, impressions of the, the monk himself. What do you see of him? What does Chaucer focus upon him? His wealth. 
Okay, uh, namely? Well, his gold. Okay, gold. Right, gold shows up an awful lot in the, 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 the general prologue. Keep on going. Jewelry and Jewelry horses. and horses and trappings and beautiful uh, leather. How, how, what's, he, what's he like as a manly man? Stout. Stout is pretty well good. Well fed. Well fed, powerful, physical, somatic, corporeal. Right? <laughs> um, and he's presented as really the opposite of what right. right. should be. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so you have a guy who's amazingly, let's get the adjectives here. Anything about his spirituality? No. Yeah. Anything about his reading scripture? Anything even about his business dealings? He is a man of the flesh. Yeah. yeah. The note says that the love knot is an elaborate knot. Yeah. Could that also be a reference to his lack of chastity? Well, there are little tweaky moments in this portrait, but then many other tweaky moments in other portraits. And as you go along, you find they become more and more suggestive. But there is there are intimations here. I mean, even pricking. He's a prickasseur, you know? Uh, I don't know. It's not quite what might come to our mind, but it was not not there as a possibility. So are the, there are these moments that make you think about what you think you should not think about, yeah. about this guy, which sort of goes along with his carnality. Yeah. Right? The and things we, about the sounds of the words uh -huh. that are more suggestive than possible their actual everyday meaning. Good, I agree. Chaucer had a great ear for the sounds of words. Now we have three more lines, and then we have to try to try to wrap this up and move forward. He was not pall as a forpeened ghost, a fat swan loved he best of any roast. His palfrey was as brune as is a beria. Any comments? Yeah. I've never depicted swan, but if it's anything like goose, we're talking about something incredibly rich. Incredibly rich and rare and expensive, right? Absolutely. And more? Well, yes. he had a robust complexion. Yep. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, he's in, he's in good point. En bon point in French. I mean, he is so... I mean, he's, he's, it's almost like he just came out of the oven, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, he's, he's so meaty, yeah. Can I call you? These two lines. He was not Paul as a four-peened ghost, a fat swan, loved he best in uh, any roast. Just tell me about poor four-peened ghost, and our notes, I don't think, help us too much. Ghost, okay. When we think of ghost in a religious ex uh, context, what do we think of? The Holy Spirit. That's what it really means here, okay? And he was not a forpeened ghost. And what are our notes here? Or tormented. Forpeened means excessively pined away. Okay, a spirit who is, you know, who is just so attenuated and, and emaciated that he's almost not flesh, okay? And Chaucer says, God, thank God he wasn't a forpeened ghost. <laughs> now, let's wait a minute. For peanut ghost, we're on a pilgrimage. What, in a, in a pilgrimage context or a Christian context, might you think of in terms of a physical presence which is for peanut and ghost like? A thin and pale? Hmm? A, a thin I, and pale? I'm thinking of a, you know, a, a just a physical form where it's a. a Are you thinking of, a, of the. Figure from an El Greco painting. Exactly. An El Greco saint, remember the very, very sort of angular, unfleshy, tortured right. souls out there in the desert praying. Or, so you can think of all of those saints. You know, this is this guy called Jesus Christ. And what do you see when you see him on the cross in the Middle Ages or in the Renaissance? A four peanut ghost, right? <laughs> But what's happening with that ideal of self-mortification, of denial, of living for the spirit and not in the flesh? What's happening here? It's been pushed way around. And the, what I want to underscore is, what's happening with us as readers? Do we just sort of say, oh, no, we don't want to put four peanut ghosts around here? Right? So you see what's happening with us as readers as Chaucer is leading us through? 
and you hit for being a ghost, and you say, how did I get here? Mm -hmm. So Chaucer is always very subtly asking, where are you? You know, what do you believe in? OK, now, <coughs> maybe 10 more minutes to do an awful lot. The rest of the Canterbury Tales. Generically, uh, extraordinary variety. Um, you have epic romances. You have saints' lives. You have beast fables, which I've mentioned already. You have tragedies, a whole list of uh, tragedies. You have the wife of Bath, somebody mentioned it. The wife of Bath, whom you may remember, uh, one of the most extraordinary women in all of English literature, who sort of takes over when she finally steps forward. Uh, she goes on, her prologue is about 700 lines, which is about 500 lines uh, longer than anybody else's prologue. And she just becomes an amazing presence. She gets involved in disputation after disputation after disputation with her imagined adversaries. And her imagined adversaries are, are, are male clerics who have been taking positions century after century after century on what subjects? First of all, marriage, yeah. Nature, women, sex. And she says, What's wrong with these people? Don't they know what the world is about? Don't they understand something about sexual desire? Don't they understand that God had a reason to make sex so damn sexy? Do they really have any idea of what women really are like? Where is all this misogyny? The Middle Ages was extraordinarily rich, nonstop misogyny. She says, why is there so much misogyny? Well, where have the women been vis-a-vis -vis the power of writing? Nowhere, because they do not have uh, the privilege of writing or of reading scripture. So she becomes a theologian of the first order. Now, she breaks all the rules. She confesses to a lot of the sins that have been attributed to women. And when you say, you say we women are this, damn right we're this. And we're even worse than that. I'll tell you about that. But she starts a whole series of, uh, of tales uh, that deal with the marriage, they call the marriage group. And uh, interestingly enough, her tale is a romance, an Arthurian romance, uh, a bit of a surprise. The very last tale in that group, I just finished re writing my article on it for, thank God, after years' labor, is the Franklin's tale. Franklin tries to resolve all the marriage issues, but it really, I think, collapses in his hands. There are saints' tales. There's a tale about alchemy. Uh, the, the group is joined. Uh, by an alchemist and his yeoman come riding in. Uh, what's happening here? And the yeoman stays, the alchemist leaves, and he tells us all about alchemy. Obviously, Chaucer was, was interested uh, in alchemy as well. And on and on and on, uh, tale after tale, talking to each other, talking to the neighbors, but also involved in a kind of uh, disputatio, as you feel like you're making some progress, but you also feel like maybe we're not making progress. Contra Dante, where you know you're starting down in Purgatorio, and I mean, you're starting down in Inferno, and then you're going up to Purgatorio, and go up and end up here. Chaucer is sort of, you're swooping around, you're crash landing, you're taking off again, and so on. So when you get to the end of uh, the Canterbury Tales, do you make it to Canterbury Cathedral? No. And it's clear that Chaucer did not want things to, his pilgrims to arrive. After his death, a few poets tried to end it. But he, I think he was thinking that this is the profoundest way to do it. Who am I to say this is the ending? Who am I to say that this is the New Jerusalem? Uh, it does end with a, uh, a long meditation on the seven deadly sins by the parson. And it also ends with Chaucer's own retraction. And as my students like to say, this really is a bummer. Because after um, all of these tales, of all of this extraordinary poetry, incredible variety of people talking about, uh, you know, a, a cornucopia of human experiences. Uh, Chaucer ends with four tales. The first one is the one that I wrote my book about, 
and the other two are about three other things, but they all seem to be meditations upon poetry and the pleasure we take in reading poetry. The last tale, the uh, Parsons tale, the Parson says, you will not get any more poetry from me. You will not get any more rhyme from me. I'm going to go to the straight and the narrow and tell you a moral, edifying, uplifting tale about the seven deadly sins and also about penitence, satisfaction, and, uh, and penance, which he does. Uh, and it's long, and it's in prose. Uh, students don't like it, but most Chaucerians uh, assign it, or at least parts of it, because they feel this is a very important part of the Canterbury Tales. At the very end, Chaucer, in his own voice, whatever that means, uh, offers his retraction, pretty short. And what he says is that uh, I may have made a lot of mistakes in writing this poetry. I may have written them in ways which led people away from the good uh, rather than uh, uh, towards the good. Uh, I had hoped that Christ would have inspired me, uh, and my intent was this. All that is written is written for our doctrine. But then he says, wherefore? And after the wherefore, he says, I want to be forgiven for all of my guilts. And my guilts are, and then he lists every work of literature that he wrote, except for the ones that are transparently, incontrovertibly Christian and didactic. And then he ends with a prayer to Christ that he be forgiven for his sins. So the Canterbury Tales ends with a kind of deconstruction of the Canterbury Tales. The Chaucer takes a 180 degree turn, it would seem, and he accepts his own poetry, his beloved poetry, as his own sins, and we're left with that paradox, or with that downer, or with all of those difficulties, to start thinking again about, well, he didn't burn them, did he? Like Kafka tried to do, but he left us in a kind of limbo land as to what poetry uh, is about, and why a man would give, give his own life to writing poetry. I think Chaucer had planned to end his poetry, poetic career that way. It wasn't a sudden, you know, oh gosh, I'm getting close to, uh, to the end of the world or something like that. But it is, uh, it's a very problem. I've written about it and I've got lots of feelings about it or thoughts about it, but it is a very powerful and challenging conclusion to a work of literature which is, you know, one of the great masterpieces of the English canon. So that's the end of my formal talk. It went on a little bit long, but yeah. In response to, to what you were yeah. just saying, um, is it possible that there was a uh, political or in some way self-protective mm -hmm. motivation to his writing that? Well, that's, as, yeah, okay, go as, ahead. Yeah. As, um, as was, I, I think, fairly common uh, throughout that era and the Renaissance, especially the Reformation, uh, uh, for people who had ideas that were out there and got nabbed by the church or whoever um, to, um, to, to write some kind of recantation for the sake of not being persecuted or not being burned at the stake or not losing their position or what have you. Is there a possibility? <coughs> There, I, think you know, I, I sort of speak in my, my own persuasion here. Mm -hmm. It's a possibility, but it's a very, very slim possibility. Everybody is writing satires, as I mentioned, against the church and the abuses of the church. Why were they doing that? Because they wanted to improve the church. You know, nobody was doubting their faith, except maybe for the Lollards that I, that, that I mentioned. Chaucer almost got into a little bit of hot water about Lollardy, uh, but, uh, but he escaped it. There were, another part of your question, Formulaic, or and not that formula doesn't mean that they didn't very deeply believe. Uh, uh, there, there are uh, people, uh, even in mid-career, uh, feeling that they needed to retract, uh, you know, their sense of responsibility for writing literature, which was not entirely appropriate. Boccaccio is one example, and took a turn in another direction. Um, my own persuasion is that Chaucer, no, he wasn't afraid of being persecuted by the church or judged by the church. My own, this is the position I've taken in writing actually, it's what Chaucer is doing, is he's writing, he's drawing a circle of authorial responsibility, not only around his work of literature, 
and not only around his work of literature and himself, his own intentions, because in that retraction talks about my intentions, this is what my intentions were, but all the way around his readers and the work and himself. In other words, he is, and this is only a hypothesis, he is holding himself accountable for all the misreadings of his poetry. He's saying, I can't simply stand back and say, there it is, guys, do with it what you will, uh, good luck. So it is a very strong self-judgment, but it's taking the, you know, taking the role of the poet extremely seriously and very much within a Christian context, that we are responsible for the ill effects of our good intentions. That, that's, that's me there. Um, but it seems to me to fit in better with the rest of the Chaucer that I know. Uh, other, hi, uh, a, a, an alumna of... Uh, Yeah, for so, printing press is 1484. How did that kind of, you know, things that have been transcribed and oh. when they're not literate people even to read in English, and how did it sort of hang in there until the printing press really gave this a chance to survive? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, it was all manuscripts until Caxton in, in, in the 1480s. What was the first work that Caxton, with his new wonderful uh, press, uh, to publish? The Canterbury Tales. Yeah, uh, but it's not like these, they didn't survive. They survived terribly well on, in manuscripts, in many, many manuscripts. The manuscripts are not in uh, perfect agreement with each other, but it's not like the, that the press uh, saved these poems, but, but like with everything else, the press made everything that was published much more available to a wider, wider readership, and that would have included Chaucer. That's right, that's right, yeah. Actually, the manuscripts are much more survivable because they are on skin, and you know that's almost indestructible. But once you get into paper, uh, things don't last quite so long. Who yeah. would have actually transcribed uh, what he was uh, writing? Uh, scribes, oh. you know, there you had script, you know, you had you had uh, small businesses uh, in London, all all in a row, and you had people who were good scribes. They wrote they they wrote it out, and it was pretty important but not very lucrative uh, job to have. Uh, Chaucer actually wrote a poem to Adam Scrivain, Adam, my scribe. Uh, if I hadn't brought my text, I would bring it to you, but, he, but he, it's a curse poem. And he just curses his uh, uh, scribe six ways to sun, uh, Sunday for getting everything wrong and for having to scrape and rub and scrap and change it over again. But you have, and one of Chaucer's scribes, has, his name has just been discovered in the last decade. Uh, that it makes a major bit of difference. Yeah. Uh, this very first one. What, when was this uh, translation, for, for lack of a better word? Okay. Who, who did this? Yeah. When was that done? I, um, as I was just driving out of my driveway, being a, a little bit late, I said, oh my goodness, I forgot something. I didn't bring the book that that translation is from. But it's only three or four years out. It's by Sheila. Fisher, she's the translator, and Norton is the, uh, is the press. And I have been very unhappy with all translations of uh, Chaucer until this one. And I'm very happy with this one. Uh, and in the course that I taught at Osher at Dartmouth to adults uh, recently, we found out that some people got so used to reading the translation on the right page, they've got over to the, to the original. So this is a very, very pleasing uh, translation. Sheila Fisher, uh, Norton. Just, just one more question, please. Uh, did he use the same, same uh, uh, approach to poetry? Is da 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 uh, he went. He was iambic pentameter couplets. That's what we're reading. So iambic pentameter is what? Da 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 da. And couplets rhyme. And he did all the Canterbury Tales, with some exception, in iambic pentameter uh, couplets. The Troilus and Cressida that I mentioned was in rhyme royal. These are seven lines, more complicated rhyme. And he wrote the entirety of that masterpiece 
in rhyme royal. He used another, a few other forms of, of rhyme, some of them parodic, some of them experimental, but for the most part, it was iambic pentameter that he used. And he was just very happy with it. Just one question, yeah. please. Are there any songs that were sung during the time he wrote this that are, were just passed down through? Can you think of it, one, one song that was written in the same time? There were a lot of lyrics that have survived, but lyric means you know, song, uh, but mostly the words. You're getting, I'm getting a little bit out of my field, but yes, there are some where the nooms, which are you know, what you write in the score to show where the voice is going that has survived, and they have been resurrected and performed. The answer is yes. Yeah? To what extent did Chaucer uh, profit from the Canterbury Tales? Not yes, much. In 1398, when uh, Henry IV came into power, Chaucer wrote a poem to the new king. You know, this is dicey, you know, now, now where are things? It's a complaint to my purse. <laughs> and my purse is too light, and I wish she were pregnant. <laughs> so um, he wasn't, uh, he never got... Uh, like yeah, that's right. He never got wealthy. Uh, he, uh, he did, John F. Gaunt was uh, a major patron uh, of him. Where did he live? Uh, before he went to Kent, he lived uh, for a good part, of, you know, for more than a decade in Allgate. And this is, uh, Allgate is a gate that's the old gate over one of the gates going into the city of London. And it was a kind of man cave. It wasn't very pleasant. It wasn't very warm. But it was free, uh, thanks to uh, Richard II. But if, but he couldn't have done bet, bet you know, he just wasn't, poets didn't make money. Uh, you know, look at Dante, who was always traveling around and mooching off uh, very important dignitaries and nobles. No. No. I mean, he made money by being a, uh, um, by working for the government. That's what he did every day. He worked for the, the, the king and for the exchequer, etc. And he made enough money to, uh, to get by. Um, but that's, that's, that's about it. A lot of his friends were much better off than he. And so he was always in this sort of liminal position with uh, well-off people, some of them quite powerful, uh, some of them quite political, uh, and some of them learned and some of them less so. But he was sort of uh, uh, the poor cousin type. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I was wondering if you could, and I recognize that this might be a difficult question given the kind of ambiguity of a number of the portraits or of the yeah. pilgrims, but to what degree would you say that, um, or do you think that Chaucer uh, was able to, or did, transcend the kind of politics of his time? In particular, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the wife of Bath, yeah. you know, which is, in some ways, I mean, you called her a theologian of the first order, yeah. but in some ways she's also made to seem ridiculous. Yeah. Or the Prioress's Tale, which you could read on one level as like an incredibly anti-Semitic yes. tale, or on an ironic level of, she's the one that looks ridiculous and mm -hmm. savage in the tale. And so um, my question is always, you know, was he able to escape the kind of prejudices of his time uh, and have a kind of more humanistic view that, um, you know, I mean, he seems like a guy who loves people, Yes. right? And so yes. it's hard for me to think of him as someone who's misogynistic or right. anti-Semitic. Um, and I'm wondering to what, where, how, you, how you've been able to deal with that ambiguity. Right. And an English teacher speaking here. Tell me your name again. Ben. Ben. Um, and, who, and when we <laughs> But I mean, Ben, wouldn't you agree that, I mean, to bring this in the classroom, you find these, these issues are so alive and that you as teacher are put on a spot. You know, what, where, what, where does Chaucer really stand? And one of the big questions of Chaucer, much more than almost other major, major poets, is who are you, Chaucer? Will the real Chaucer please stand up? And um, he's been called a Laodicean. That is Laodiceans that they don't, they're always on both sides of the fence at once. And Chaucer is very, very careful not to show his hand. Or he'll play peekaboo, right? Fort Da. He'll go back and forth, back and forth. With uh, the two examples you mentioned, we'll take the, the, uh, <clears throat> the Priors' tale, 
rife with anti-Semitism. No, I mean, it's, it's there from beginning to end. Well, Chaucer's living in an anti-Semitic time. In the, the Parsons' tale, there are passages that are anti-Semitic. The Jews are, in the Parsons' tale are, are, are accused of being responsible for, for, for Christ's death. Is this Chaucer's embracing a position like that? We always want to make writers from the past that we really love and enjoy and admire more modern you know, uh, than they, they might really be. This happens with Shakespeare a lot. He was really way ahead of his time, whatever in the world uh, that means. I think, to use another one of the words, I mean, I think Chaucer is a humanist, but a Christian humanist. He's much more interested, finally, I think, and this is my shtick, in where we stand, where we are, our belief systems are, and so on. But the wife of Bath is a real challenge, uh, and he does not make it easy for you. He's not, I, I, he's not being you know, misogynistically uh, satirical from beginning to end, but he's not, I used to be involved. Peter, were you there when we had a debate, Alan, Gaylord, and I? Ah, oh, okay, those are the old days. Uh, the, the senior medievalist and I decided that we'd take the wife of Bath on as a uh, entertaining teaching uh, uh, icon. And uh, Alan, who was a remarkable actor uh, and brilliant in so many ways, my senior colleague, I just dedicated my article last week to him, uh, and I took roles. Alan was Alana Scoliartis, and Alan was all for life, love, women, song, dance, the most liberal readings of the of scripture you could possibly have. And I was Petrus Travisensis, and I came in in sort of Franciscan garb, whacking my head, you know, ashes and things like that. But for almost two hours, we went at it, citing scripture, you know, Galatians, St. Thomas, uh, St. Aquinas and things like that, I mean, and St. Augustine and so on, really doing a full number on this debate as it was a disputation in Chaucer's own time. So in Chaucer's own time, the whole question of uh, St. Thomas was actually absolutely liberal, hard to believe, but why it, it should sex in marriage be a pleasure? Isn't marriage a sacrament? But isn't sex a sin or venial sin at least? It's a whole wonderful book called Contraception by, by the Jesuit priest on this. Chaucer is in the middle of that, and yes, he does not make it easy for you. You don't know where he stands. But finally, I, I, I think he's asking, well, where do you stand? These are, you know, and this is not simply pro and contra or anything like that. And the same thing with anti-Semitism. I think that, and I'm talking, but, uh, I think that Chaucer is more evolved than Shakespeare. On, in Shakespeare's Shylock, more of all, I'll, I'll take that stand. It'll take me a long time to try to defend myself on that. But even so, that doesn't mean that uh, he is a, you know, a wondrous you know, liberal by 21st century standards. A few more questions? Yeah. Yes? Um, you just say at the beginning, one thing that unites you is that they're all pilgrims. I don't yes. know how much you make of that. But me, myself? Yeah. Um, more than just an observation? I make an awful lot of that. Um, but we sort of almost forget that they're on a pilgrimage because they get involved in all sorts of debates, battles, scurrilous stuff. In fact, the last tale, which is a kind of Ovidian myth, is about as disgusting. You know, Ovid, who writes about poetry and metaphor and metamorphosis and so on, it is so sickening that Chaucer's last poem should be a poem about poetry where there is no redeeming value whatsoever. So I think Chaucer, what's the question I'm asking? Uh, sorry. They're all pilgrims. Oh, yes. And so, I mean, where's Dante? By the end of you know, the Divine Comedy, you're right up there in the seventh sphere, right? The Prima Mobile. Chaucer, you're mucking, you know, you're sort of walking along in the muck, trying to make your way past a town called Bob, up and down, you know, on your way, but you haven't made it here. It's sort of very modern or postmodern. That, um, but that, in a way, is a kind of cri de coeur. I thought we were supposed to be on a pilgrimage. I thought we were going towards salvation. I thought poetry could save us, or at least help us. And or we, at least as a group, as a community, can help each other. And this is like, you know, the Whereas it's turned uh, into a peripatetic 
Moth hour. Moth, moth hour. It's certainly a peripatetic something or other, but it's, 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 it's going downhill. You know, it's like a Bruegel painting, going downhill. Yes? This uh, photograph here, yeah. uh, can you give us an idea of how many people, very few people could read this? How did they, who were the ones that made the copies of it? How many copies were available? What were the class of people that were privileged to, to read this? Uh -huh. And uh, did they have any public readings or anything? Okay, three questions or three and a half questions. One, uh, for the most part, they would be they'd be aristocrats and the learned and the wealthy who would have copies or who could read it. But remember, we've got a pretty large group of people who are the intelligentsia. I mean, you know, you've, if you've got any education, no problem whatsoever uh, in reading it. It's owning it, which is uh, is the real challenge because every one of these is extremely, extremely. Uh, expensive. So if you had 12 books in your library, you were almost like a, like a millionaire. Um, and that's another, that's a three and a half questions. This one right here, I, I noticed I just ran them off uh, and I, I, I skipped off the, t I, I skimmed off the top. But that's the most famous manuscript. That's the Ellesmere manuscript. If you've ever been to the Huntington Library in, in uh, Pasadena, California, there it is. I got a wonderful scholarship for a year there, and I would go and genuflect in front of that one. That was a presentation copy, which means it was done very beautifully to be very valued, to be very expensive. We don't know to whom it was given or, or who, you know, who was the patron, but that's unusual. The other manuscripts are just doing their work. When, when was it written, this particular? Okay, 15th century, you know, within 25 years after Charles' death. Way back in the... Oh, thank you. Um, given that we don't really, you know, know where Chaucer stands at any given point yeah. of his work, um, I've seen various editions that do not include the retraction. Really? Yeah, uh, by the library. Um, has Which library? Feinecke at Yale. Oh, there's a manuscript there without the retraction? Okay, all right. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, are we certain that this was something because there was a time when whoever was the scribe or, you know, producing a manuscript would insert, you know, something that you wanted to put in, not necessarily what was Chaucer's. Yeah, you know, there have been so many attempts by a few scholars to try to save ourselves from the retraction, <laughs> if you follow me, right? And, you know, one of them says, well, that line, I don't think Chaucer wrote, okay? Or he went, a, a scribe wrote that and things like that. But the, the preponderance of the evidence, manuscript after manuscript after manuscript, is that the retraction is there. Chaucer wanted to be there. It, it flows right from the Parsons' tale. So it's this wishful thinking to try to make it go away. Not that some people, I mean, there, it could be that some, you know, there are about 87 different manuscripts, and they're, they're far from being equal to each other. But I'll trust her and say, Chaucer meant it to be there, and he meant it to be that way. And then the next step is, what do, you, what do you do with it? Since you said he didn't burn them, uh, if he let, and if you re get through all this, you're enjoying it. That's right. So when you get to the retraction at the very end, you've made the journey. That's right. Wouldn't the retraction like that make you kind of say, well, but no, but this part was wonderful, this part was wonderful, and it would make you highlight all the best things huh. in the work and therefore you, you know you're going to say well I'm not going to be like that person but because yep. I think a decent moral Christian person would read or you know a Christian at the time would read it and know what's who's good and who's bad right. and a retraction like that would make you just kind of cling to the better parts well, what are the better parts well, Chelsea, what, what, what the better parts that you would get out of it that any any anything that you positive that you got out of it right. that would make you know I shouldn't be like that or I should be like that. Chaucer has a quote from Romans 15.4 that he uses twice. Once is in the retraction. <clears throat> All that is written is written for our doctrine, for our doctrine, and that is my intent. All that is written is written for our doctrine, our teaching, our education, our doctrine, and that is my intent. I've dwelt in print on this at great length. 
And it's exactly what you know, you're talking about. Well, if everything has been written for our doctrine, for our education, that means that everything is for our own good or for our own education. In other words, whatever it is, if it's a graffito, you know, if it's rap, if it's trash, if it's pornography, if it's whatever, there's something there that may be for our doctrine, okay? And that's, that was actually John, uh, uh, John Milton's position, because good and ill are so intermeddled, we cannot have uh, censorship, except for religious tracts and things, okay? So I think Chaucer is, another thing you were saying is that he's probably asking us to reread, go back again. If this came as a total shock, maybe you have not been reading it as well as you might be reading it. He does the same thing, or similar thing, uh, with uh, Troilus and Crusader. But when you, I mean, you use your phrase, the, what we like most, I think Charles is asking us, well, what are our principles of liking this? You know? Is it the juicy parts? <coughs> Only the juicy parts? Only the, the fablio or things like that? Everything is part of this, you know, this vision that he has. And maybe we should read the saints' lives much more carefully. Only like the juicy parts. Most people might go, gee, we didn't have a problem. Should yeah. Be yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 Well, Mine recall from reading, you know, this was aeons ago, is it was it was revealing to me about the personalities um, and surprising about. It was enlightening and, and mm -hmm. on, on the yeah. characters and how he was describing them. Right. You know, because he was taking, you know, away an aura that you would have about certain figures like monks. Mm-hmm. And then I think we're probably ready. Uh, probably ready. Now, one more question? One, one more question, yes. Um, still funny after all these years. Do you want to give us just one or two examples of what you found funny in the Canterbury Tales? I, that actually is not my title. It's made up by, I, I gave this the first Wednesday talk somewhere else, and they said, we're going to jazz this up, and, so they, and I said I'd, I'd use it. Um, I think I would first probably identify Chaucer as a comic poet, uh, but that doesn't mean it's just full of you know, hijinks. He wrote tragedies, he wrote saints' lives, he wrote a whole variety of poems. But I think he's comically profound. Probably the best known uh, uh, low jinx uh, moment in Chaucer. I mean, most of most of the uh, the funniness is, um, is in the way he tells the story. But Chaucer is well known for the Miller's Tale. The Miller's Tale is a bad uh, fabio. It's one of the best bad jokes ever written. It's very long, and complicated. <laughs> but there's a moment that everybody remembers, where there's there's a triangle. Uh, there are two young lovers, male, both of them, one of them very somatic, one of them sort of a fruits and boots kind of guy, and they're, and they're uh, courting the same young wife of an old carpenter, and um, the uh, fruits and uh, boots guy with his guitar and so on is going to go and serenade Allison, who's uh, already agreed uh, to go to bed with his, his, uh, his competitor, and she just says, go away, go away, go away. And he says, oh, please kiss me at least before I leave. And uh, she says, okay, make yourself ready. And she sticks her rear end, the thing to the note on, to, and, uh, out, the, uh, out the window. And he gets on his knees and puts up his, uh, he, he's, he's very um, a labial kind of guy, <laughs> and, so, and uh, to, to kiss her. And uh, what she does, he says, he, he, and then he uh, starts back and he says, a beard, a beard. I never thought a woman had a beard. <laughs> so now he, uh, he's, he's been uh, dissolved, he's been sort of saved from all of his romantic illusions, but he now wants justice and revenge. So he goes in the middle of the night and gets a, a plowshare from Gervais, who's, uh, who's the blacksmith. So he's got this hot plowshare that he brings back and he asks Allison to uh, come back because he has a ring that he's going to give her as a present. And Allison's lover, uh, the other clerk, they've been in bed all night, says, uh, it's my turn now. 
And he says, this is not funny, is it? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and so he, he, he puts his arse out uh, the, uh, uh, the, the window, and then the hot culture goes out that arse. And uh, Nicholas, he says, water, water, God's sakes, water. Now I have to go back and tell you another part of the story. Uh, the carpenter husband has been duped by Nicholas that the world is coming to an end, and they have to, like, um, uh, like uh, Noah and his wife, uh, come up with uh, s uh, some uh, kneading troughs so they can float out uh, when the, uh, and be saved from the flood. So this stupid old carpenter uh, builds these, uh, <clears throat> puts these uh, kimmelins up in the, uh, up in the uh, rafters of the, uh, of the barn, and then he falls asleep in one of them. And he wakes up and he hears somebody, water, water. <laughs> it's the end of the world. <laughs> so as he was instructed, he cuts the, uh, he, he cuts the ropes, and down he goes, uh, the floor, Everybody from town, especially the clerks, run, look at, look at this old guy, and laugh at him and said, this man is woe, this man is crazy. It really, and see, it isn't funny that way, is it? But as you have been set up for it, because you've forgotten all about Walter, you've forgotten all about the, uh, about the, uh, uh, the end of the world, and you, despite yourself, participate in the kind of rough comic justice that is being uh, administered to these three male Foolish guys. Boy, that's a bad joke. But, <laughs> but I still think it's one of the funniest uh, stories in literature. Peter. A bad joke and a great evening, Peter. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.